Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, March 18th. We are still in Unit 1 for the Spring Quarter, which is entitled Follow in My Ways. Follow in My Ways. And of course, those ways are the ways of God. Uh, we've got a great lesson today. Uh, it's a follow on to the lesson we had last week, lesson number two. This is lesson three from our adult quarterly. The lesson title is Finding Inspiration. Finding Inspiration. And our lesson text is taken from Second Chronicles chapter seven verses one to nine. Second Chronicles chapter seven verses one to nine. Our devotional reading is Psalm one thirty eight. And our background scripture, Second Chronicles 7, chapter 1 to 11. From the adult quarterly, the lesson aims or identify ways the passage shows the people's thankful worship of God. Number two, aspire to worship God in simple and grand ways. Then number three, plan a worship service to celebrate God's promises. Celebrate God's promises. The lesson has three major divisions. This is the adult quarterly again. The first division is uh, titled A Divine Testimony to Prayer. A Divine Testimony to Prayer. And that's covered between Second uh, Chronicles chapter 7 verses 1 to 3. The second division is Generosity for God's Blessing. That's covered between verses 4 and 7. And the third is an extended worship experience. And that's covered between verses 7 and 8. From the standard commentary, the lesson title is, The People Gave Thanks to God. The People Gave Thanks to God. And additional aims, lesson aims are, number one, Describe God's response to Solomon's prayer of dedication at the temple and how Solomon and the people gave thanks to God. Number two, explain why giving thanks to God receives the emphasis it does, does in today's passage. And then number three, suggest one specific way to make giving thanks a consistent part of his or her daily lives, to make it a consistent part of our lives. And I certainly hope that uh, uh, that thank, thanksgiving is a part of every prayer, our daily prayers to God. Uh, the standard commentary also has three major divisions. The first is entitled Fire from God. It's covered between chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. The second is Worship by People. Cover, to cover between verses 4 and 6. And the third, further actions, that's covered between verses 7 and 9. And what I'd like to do uh, before, well, actually, let me give a little background, and then we'll, uh, we'll read the lesson text, and then we'll just jump in and have some verse-by-verse -verse discussion. Um, the the background of Chronicles, in particular Second Chronicles, is the same as it was last week. Um, we know it was it's believed to have been written by uh, Ezra, and this is after the Babylonian captivity, and it records uh, principally the uh, uh, the the kings uh, that were descendants of David and the activities, of course, uh, during uh, the reigns of those kings uh, it, that were part of the southern kingdom or Judah. Um, the last week we read uh, how Solomon had just completed the construction of the temple. Uh, it was basically uh, an upscale uh, version of the tabernacle that had been in the wilderness and that uh, really uh, had been the the meeting place uh, for uh, God and the congregation of Israel. 
through David's reign, David, as we recall, wanted to build the temple, and he really wanted it to be something magnificent that would glorify God and be a wonder of the world. Uh, but God forbade him uh, from doing that, and we can read about that in Second Samuel chapter uh, 7, uh, and uh, I think beginning at verse 12 and beyond. Uh, the... So, but but David did lay up materials uh, for the construction of the temple and did a great job in preparing uh, for what his son Solomon would do. And God said that his son, the one that would come out of his own loins, would actually uh, construct the temple. So Solomon did construct the temple, and it was magnificent. And we our lesson last week uh, basically focused on Solomon's. Uh, dedicatory prayer after the Ark of the Covenant was brought into the Holy of Holies. And uh, this lesson, the lesson today, follows immediately uh, after that dedicatory prayer that was offered in chapter 6. And during that prayer, uh, it was an intercessory prayer primarily. It was a prayer of thanksgiving for God's faithfulness to his promise to David and to Israel. But it was also uh, an intercessory prayer for the nation of Israel. And in that prayer, uh, Solomon made 13 specific requests for God to hear and for God to respond and for God to forgive. Uh, so we're going to read now uh, the response to the dedication, uh, or at least the dedicatory prayer. There's more to follow uh, the dedic uh, that prayer, the sacrifice, uh, the tremendous sacrifices that were made, and then the uh, the feasts that were uh, held, uh, both to dedicate uh, the temple, as well as the customary feast of tabernacle or booths or in gathering, which followed immediately uh, this week of celebrating uh, the dedication of the temple. So we're going to read uh, Second Chronicles, verses 1 to 9, and hopefully you read the, the whole chapter. I like to put uh, the lesson text in context, and so I typically will read the whole chapter, at least. So it begins, Now, when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord, because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down, and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement, and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifice before the Lord. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice of twenty and two thousand oxen and a hundred and twenty thousand sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God, and the priests waited on their offices, the Levites also with instruments of music of the Lord, which David the king had made to praise the Lord, because his mercy endureth forever. When David praised by their ministry, and the priests sounded trumpets before them, and all Israel stood. Moreover, Solomon hollowed the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for there he had offered burnt offerings and the fat of the peace offerings, because the brazen altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offerings and the meat offerings and the fat. Also, at the same time, Solomon kept the feast seven days, and all Israel with him, a very great congregation, from the entering in of Hamath unto the river of Egypt. And in the eighth day they made a solemn assembly, for they kept the dedication of the altar seven days, and the feast seven days. Seven days they dedicated the temple. And seven days they kept the Feast of Booths, or Feast of Tabernacles. And our key verse is verse 3, 
which is when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let's just have a quick word of prayer. And Father, we do thank you for your mercy. We thank you that your mercy does endure forever, Lord. We thank you always for your loving kindness and your tender mercies, the new mercies that we receive day by day. And we ask for your understanding of this lesson, Lord. We ask that as we understand this lesson, that our faith be increased. And as our faith is increased, Lord, we pray that our obedience to your word might be increased and that we would do all things to your praise and glory, Lord, as we understand your desire from your word, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Now, we are going to uh, begin with uh, <clears throat> verse 1, uh, part A. Verse 1, part A reads, Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and sacrifice. Now, if you recall from last week, the, the prayer that Solomon gave was just a beautiful, elegant prayer, again, of praise and intercession. And uh, the Lord is responding to that prayer. And he's responding in a miraculous way. Uh, not one that he hasn't uh, used before. Uh, we know that uh, when the tabernacle was dedicated, um, that the Lord also, uh, uh, he, he, in Leviticus chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, at that dedication, we see that the Lord had fire come out and consume the sacrifice. Well, in this case, uh, in the presence of I'm sure thousands of Israelites, the Lord uh, rains fire from heaven and it consumes the burnt offerings and sacrifices in, a, again, an astounding, uh, miraculous way. And you can imagine uh, how the people uh, might have responded to this. Now, these, these people, of course, were, uh, uh, were living centuries uh, after uh, the Lord performed a similar miracle in the wilderness. We know that some centuries later, the Lord will also perform a similar miracle by uh, Elijah the prophet uh, when he's confronting the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. We can see that in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 38. Um, and part B says, And the glory of the Lord filled the house. Now, this is the same glory, this thick cloud that was spoken of back in chapter 5, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 14. And it was so thick that this cloud appeared immediately after the priest set the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holy Places. And it was so thick then that they could not minister, they could not perform their duties in the temple. Well, this is a, this is a manifestation of God's glory it's it symbolizes his presence in the place and it also symbolizes his pleasure with what is going on with this dedication uh his acceptance of the temple and his acceptance of the uh, as i said the uh, the beautiful prayer that was offered just before he consumes the sacrifice by fire and fills the temple with this thick cloud now, you know, it was obvious that God was demonstrating his pleasure in his presence in this, uh, at this dedication. The uh, question here for us is, how do we know today, how do we sense God's presence, and how do we know his presence is genuine? And some points for discussion here, uh, or regarding his love, I mean, do we sense his love, do we feel his love, and then regarding his correction, do we sense his correction when we are, uh, when we're sinning, uh, do we grieve the Holy Spirit, and do we sense uh, his correcting hand, uh, something to think about. Verse 2 says, And the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord, because... 
the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. Again, this is this thick cloud that uh, I'm sure they could not see through. It was so thick. And so they were not able to perform duties without stumbling about. So, again, uh, God is, is just, uh, it, it, it appears uh, delighted again in what's going on and showing that uh, by this manifestation of his glory. Verse 3, let's look at part A here. The people bowed down. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord. Um, the adult quarterly commentator makes makes a comment that I thought was very true, and that is, the appropriate response to the power and presence of God is always worship. It is always worship. And these people, it appears, became prostrate. They took a, a posture of worship uh, uh, in, the, in the face of this awesome demonstration of God's presence and glory. And, and they worshipped him and praised him. Uh, they praised him for uh, his goodness to Israel, his, his the fulfillment of his promises, not only to David, but to Abraham. We'll see in a minute how he has made them indeed a multitude. And under the Davidic reign and the reigns of Solomon, they occupied as much of the land that God had promised Abraham as they ever did. They were at the zenith of their uh, their uh, in, uh, their uh, national life uh, during the reigns of David and Solomon. Uh, never again would they possess as much land as uh, we'll discuss a little further along. A part B of lesson three of the verse three rather says saying for he is good for his mercy endureth forever. He is good for his mercy endureth forever. And this is a refrain that we see Many, many places uh, throughout the Old Testament, uh, it uh, was voiced back in chapter 5, verse 13, when the Ark of the Covenant was brought into the Holy of Holies. Uh, it actually was taken from a psalm of David, uh, and uh, it was a psalm that was written when the ark was brought up to Jerusalem. We can read about that in First Chronicles chapter 16, verses 7 and 34. And it became uh, a refrain that became part of the worship service that is mercy or steadfast love endures forever. And, and there's really, um, it's mentioned over 40 times uh, in, the, in, the, in the Old Testament. Uh, and uh, we can see it uh, prominently uh, mentioned in Psalms 100, 106, 107, 118, and 131. And, uh, and, and, and uh, the last one, 131, actually all 26 verses conclude with that refrain, and his mercy endures forever. Some of you are familiar with that. Now, we, we've often uh, defined mercy as um, God not giving us what we deserve, and that is uh, punishment for our sins. And, we've def and grace is the flip side of that same coin. It is his unmerited favor, him giving us what we don't deserve. But in this context, it not only means that, him not giving us what we deserve, it has a broader meaning of uh, his steadfast love. They are praising God for his steadfast love for his people, Israel. Uh, and, and that word could have been defined uh, or translated steadfast love. Of course, what motivates God to not give us what we deserve, the just punishment that we deserve, is, of course, his love. So uh, that's it's not surprising that we should see uh, them praising God. And we certainly recognize that today. God's goodness and his mercy and his steadfast love for us. Now, we're entering into the second division in the standard. 
worship by people worship by people in fact uh, let me just mention that the uh, verse three was our key verse and again uh we are to uh, uh, we're, we're 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 realizing that this is an historical narrative uh but we are to uh to learn uh, from uh, everything that we read in the Bible. It's either directed to us or written for our example. And this example of praise, again, is just that it is written for our uh, example in how we are to praise and what God delights in. It, it really gives us an understanding of, of God delighting in praise and the praise of his people. So let's move into uh, worship by people, uh, verse 4. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. Now, this is the worship. Uh, this is beyond the words of praise. The actual acts of worship then are the making of sacrifices. And as we go through and see uh, what is really an unimaginable number of animals that were sacrificed, uh, let's understand what what we're really talking about here this sacrifice of animals is not uh just the i mean the, the killing of animals. it is actually giving these people are actually giving of something that they have that's very meaningful to them to them uh remember this is an agrarian culture and livestock and 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 crops are really uh what sustains their life and so this act of of sacrificing this enormous number of animals is a tremendous act of of, of praise uh, and 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 uh, and and trusting and, and, and demonstrating, if you will, trust in God uh, be, by giving something that is uh, uh, very meaningful, very expensive uh, that these people possess. So verse five says, and King Solomon offered a sacrifice of twenty and. 2,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. Now those are just astronomical numbers and it's just hard for us to imagine that number of animals. And I, I assume, I, I think I originally thought that Solomon offered all these animals of his own flocks and herds, but uh, I'm sure all the people contributed, and of course the numbers were rounded, uh, all the people contributed to this great sacrifice. It just says Solomon was the lead, if you will, in, in, in orchestrating, if you will, the sacrifices. And, uh, the, you know, some, uh, there are some uh, that don't think that these numbers are to be taken literally, However, uh, there's really nothing in the Bible that suggests that they shouldn't be. We're going to read in a few minutes how there was not enough room on this altar, which if you recall last week we said was like 30 feet by 30 feet by I think 10 feet high, this brazen altar uh, for all these sacrifices and Solomon had to dedicate or consecrate another area, a large area outside the temple. So there's really nothing to suggest that these were not uh, the actual numbers rounded, uh, and uh, the people were just pouring out their hearts again uh, with this hundred total of 142,000 animals. And it's estimated that to sacrifice that many animals would be 20 sacrifices a minute, 10 hours a day for 12 straight days, and we don't know how they did it, but. Uh, we have no reason to believe otherwise that they didn't actually sacrifice that number of animals. Now, there are different sacrifices, as we'll discuss in a minute as well. The burnt offerings, the peace offerings. Uh, we'll read about uh, how the fat was offered uh, and so forth in, in just a few minutes. So how, does, how do the sacrifices relate to us? I mean, I think it suggests that we are to give uh, lavishly and abundantly uh, to God, to the work of God, uh, or God's church, if you will, and other ministries that demonstrate the love of God, that actually show the love of God to the world. 
uh, we're to give cheerfully, you know, not grudgingly or of necessity. Uh, and, and that's de- certainly demonstrated in the offering of this tremendous number of animals. So let's move in now to verse uh, 6 where we, we see further uh, worship and praise offered. Uh, verse 6 reads, And the priests waited on their offices, the Levites also with instruments of music of the Lord, which David the king had made to praise the Lord, because his mercy endureth forever. When David praised by their ministries, and the priests sounded trumpets before them, and all Israel stood. We're going to read that. I'm going to take a look at that in uh, from the NIV uh, for just a little clearer reading, I think. And it reads, The priests took their positions, as did the Levites, with the Lord's musical instruments, which David which rather King David had made for praising the Lord, and which were used when he gave thanks, saying, His love endures forever. Opposite the Levites, the priests blew their trumpets, and all Israel was were standing. <clears throat> now, so what's going on? I mean, David uh, not only prepared... Of the materials for the construction of the temple. But David also, being a musician himself, you may recall that he was uh, often called by, by King Saul to play a harp when Saul was, we believe, or uh, perhaps demon possessed when this evil spirit came upon him to soothe him. Uh, so David was called a sweet psalmist uh, of the Lord. Uh, uh, we can read that in uh, 2 Samuel 23, 1. Uh, he's referred to as the sweet psalmist of Israel. And we know that many of the psalms, if not all of them that he wrote, were set to music. And so David was a musical person. And David perhaps even designed some of these instruments that were used. Uh, but he also organized the Levites and the priests and basically into worship groups, uh, into groups that would provide types of various types of music during the worship service. And that's what's going on here. Uh, the trumpets were sounding and, and this was and there were other types of music I'm sure. But all this is part of the uh uh the praise uh service that uh David, uh the Lord I'm sure inspired David to introduce. And now, music in our worship service is very commonplace today. I mean, we, I don't know that we would know how to have a worship service without, without praise, without music. And so, but this all seems to have begun, uh, at least in the life of Israel, so, uh, the nation Israel, with David uh, actually putting together the musical uh, accompaniment of praise. And that's what's being done as part of this dedicatory service, as part of the dedication service. And then move into, uh, let's move into um, chapter, uh, verse 7 rather. Verse 7 reads, Moreover, Solomon hallowed the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the peace offerings because the brazen altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offerings and the meat offerings and the fat. Now, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we, have, we don't have any reason. Uh, there's nothing in the in the Bible here that suggests that the numbers of animal sacrifice was not to be taken literally. And if, it, if we do take them literally, then we can understand how even a brazen altar that's 30 feet by 30 feet by 10 feet high is, is inadequate to sacrifice the number, that number of animals in a reasonable time. So Solomon, it says he hallowed. And that means he consecrated or dedicated uh, 
an area, and I'm sure it was a large area, in front of the temple where they could also offer sacrifice. Now, what they did, what that they assembled some type of temporary altars, not sure, uh, or maybe just uh, arranged wood for the sacrifices in this large area, not sure, but uh, this this obviously was uh, something that was acceptable and God uh, didn't have any displeasure with. And uh, and it talks about the different types of offering. This verse talks about the different types of offerings that were made. The burnt offerings and the fat of the peace offering. Uh, and it also talks about the meat offerings. So what are we talking about? The burnt offering uh, described in Leviticus 1 uh, really was made to address the issues of sin or of dedication to the Lord. Uh, that's what the burnt offering, and we, and we hear about whole burnt offerings as well, were to to address. Uh, the meat offering represents a grain offering. This was uh, an offering from the crops. Uh, and the word meat really is describing the the, the choice part of the of the crop or the grain, if you will, and uh, the uh, uh, we see in Leviticus two uh, fourteen. And we'll turn over that for just a minute. Leviticus two fourteen reads, "And if thou offer a meat offering of thy first fruits, this is the first fruits of their crops, unto the Lord, thou shalt offer for the meat offering of thy." First fruits, green ears of corn dried by fire, even corn beaten out of full ear. So we're talking about a, a crop offering here. And that, of course, was to uh, to give uh, thanks, symbolize thanksgiving to God for for his provision of those crops. The peace offering. What was the peace offering? Well, the, the peace offering was only... Uh, the only offering in which a portion of uh, that that was sacrificed was eaten by the worshipers and the priests. And we read about that in Leviticus chapter 3, uh, verses 7, I'm sorry, chapter 3 rather, and then chapter 7, verses 11 to 18. And uh, we won't take the time to go there, but do read that um, when you have time. Chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. But Essentially, what the Lord wanted sacrificed or uh, actually offered as a burnt portion was the fat uh, uh, and the gall and the liver and those internal organs. And the rest of the meat was to be eaten uh, that day. Uh, and in some cases, depending on uh, what type of uh, petition was being made, uh, uh, they could eat some of it the next day. But it certainly, if anything lasted beyond that, it was to be burned. Uh, but the uh, this this uh, this peace offering was uh, was one that that uh, represented. It was uh, the peace offering was a, an offer for thanksgiving, as well. We we can read about that uh, in uh, Leviticus chapter seven verse twelve. It says, "If he offer it for a thanksgiving." Then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened uh, cakes mingled with oil and unleavened wafers anointed with oil and cakes mingled with oil of fine flour. So it was to be offered with uh, other uh, uh, accoutrements, if you will. But it was uh, typically for peace offerings. Uh, it could be offered, uh, I believe, as a dedication of oneself. Uh, and uh, and so so there were again different types of offerings being made. Um, let's move on to and, and and let me just how does that relate to us now? I mean, we uh, we certainly offer uh, uh, or re required, I think, uh, by um, the Holy Spirit to offer to the work of the church. Uh, in fact, Paul. Uh, really, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, tells uh, the church to lay by uh, themselves in store uh, 
uh, for a certain day, the, the worship day, uh, what they intend to give to the Lord. And that was for the, the work of the church. But, but also, uh, we are, uh, to give, uh, to the needy. We're to give to the poor. Uh, we're told in, in the Old Testament days, they were, uh, they made, God made provisions for the, for the poor and destitute by not having landowners, uh, uh, farmers to glean or to even uh, harvest the corners of their fields. Uh, so we're to, we're to make provisions for uh, the needy uh, and I think also for missionaries, for those who carry the Gospels to the different parts of the world. And, and of course, this is to be at some cost to us. I mean, uh, I think, I mean, there, there are arguments today about whether the tithe is, uh, is required uh, of Christians and no, I mean, we're not under the law anymore, but I think God demonstrated what he thought was a reasonable portion of what he's blessed us with to return to him. And so the tithe is, the tithe is really the beginning point. That's, that's where we should start. But then as God leads, uh, and as he blesses us, we're to honor the Lord with the substance, with our substance and with the first fruit of our increase. Let's go on to verse 8. Uh, also, and it reads, also at the same time Solomon kept the feast seven days, and all Israel with him, a very great congregation, from the entering in of Hamath unto the river of Egypt. Now, it, it's when it says kept the feast seven days, uh, he is talking about the feast of booths, or the feast of of tabernacles, and then I said it's also called, known as ingathering, and actually that was to start uh, the in the seventh month. And we see that they're in the seventh month in verse ten. That's the verse that just is just beyond our lesson text, and it's the fifteenth day of the month. So he was to, they were to start, and and so if we go back to Chronicles. Uh, Second Chronicles 5, 3, we see, well, Solomon called all the men, uh, over 21, 21 and over to Jerusalem, and they all came to celebrate this feast, and no doubt they brought, uh, some women and children, perhaps, uh, and they came from the, 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 the very, uh, northern border, which was Hamath, uh, to, and the very southern border, which is this, this river of Egypt, which was also called uh, Wada, Wada, uh, but uh, when God gave, um, spelled out the territory boundaries that He intended to for the Israelites to possess uh, uh, during Moses' day, I'm sorry, uh, He uh, uh, He actually we can read about that in Numbers chapter 34, verses five to eight. Uh, the northernmost point was Hamath, was Hamath, and Wada or El Arish was marked the southernmost point. So these people came from from far and near uh, for this dedication and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And the Feast of Booths uh, had two purposes. It actually they lived in tents for a week, at least a week in this case, uh, and they. It was to remind them of the, the of their uh, wilderness uh, journey, of their journey in the wilderness where they stayed in tents. But also, it was a, a feast of harvest, the ingathering. It was to to celebrate God's ble the blessing of God in uh, bringing in uh, the crop, and it was around harvest time. So it was a time of great celebration, and it was to to involve seven days of feast. Uh, in and of itself, and then a, a day, a, a solemn day, uh, actually a solemn day, and then and then uh, the seven days of feast. And so that's what we see here. Uh, the uh, and as I said earlier, the children of Israel uh, uh, were in their zenith as far as the land that they possessed that God had promised them during the reigns of David and. Solomon. And during Solomon's reign, he had 40 years of peace and prosperity. 
Solomon took tribute from other nations around. Never had they had uh, uh, such a glorious kingdom. And if you remember, uh, many times throughout Jesus' earthly ministries, his disciples would ask, are you going to restore the kingdom at this time? Well, the kingdom that they were talking about was the Davidic and, Sol- and, and uh, the Solomonic kingdom. And then finally, uh, verse 9 reads, And in the eighth day they made a solemn assembly, for they kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. Well, you have to think that this uh, solemn assembly was a time for uh, just solemn worship and praise. Uh, It was not um, a feast uh, day on this day. It was a time of prayers, I'm sure, um, offered by many. And uh, and, and, and the Lord called for solemn assemblies at various times of the year, and this was one of those. And... uh, we see that if you read on beyond uh, chapter, I'm sorry, verse uh, verse nine to verse ten, which finishes that passage, uh, it reads, "And every meat offering mingled with oil uh, and dry shall all the sons of." I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong wrong book here. Sorry, I was in Leviticus. Uh, Chronicles chapter 7 verse 10, again, which finishes the passage, reads, And on the twenty, on the th- three and twentieth day of the seventh month, he sent the people away unto their tents, glad and merry in heart for the goodness that the Lord had shown unto David and to Solomon and to Israel. So God had shown his goodness uh, to David in keeping his promise uh, of uh, having his son complete the temple. And we know that God had promised uh, that not a man uh, would fail, of his uh, descendants would fail to sit on the throne, and ultimately one of his descendants would uh, would, uh, rule forever. Uh, We know that was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And to Solomon, of course, he blessed him in keeping the, the promise to David and blessed the nation through him and having him be the one that orchestrated the construction of the temple. And then, of course, he had tremendously blessed the people with abundance. And this is a time of great peace again and abundance in Israel. And they have much to praise God for it. And, and let me just say, we, we are to praise God in everything. In everything we are to give thanks for. This is the will of God concerning us in Christ Jesus. First Thessalonians 5 and 18. Uh, and that is in hard times and in good times. When we suffer, uh, when we go through trials that draw us closer to God, we are to praise God. Uh, James uh, chapter 1 says, Count it all joy when we fall into various trials. Uh, knowing this, that the trials of our faith worketh patience, and we are to let patience have its perfect work, that we may be perfect and entire or complete and mature, wanting nothing, lacking nothing. And so we thank God for uh, this lesson today. Uh, you know, I think the takeaways for us as Christians today are, number one, a great example of uh, uh, the uh, what to do. I think, to, to please God. Uh, God obviously shows his pleasure uh, as he reacts to the dedicatory prayer and the sacrifice. Uh, we are to pray earnestly and, in, and uh, we are to offer intercessory prayers. We're not to always be asking for things for ourselves, but we are to intercede for others as Solomon did uh, in chapter 6. Uh, in making those 13 specific requests. Uh, and then we are to give, uh, we are to give hilariously, you know, uh, to the work of the Lord. 
uh, and to the ministries of the church and to help others and to show the love of, of God in tangible ways. We, that's how we have real compassion. Compassion is, is what moves us to do something for someone else when we can. And then uh, also uh, we, uh, so that, that's, that's the primary takeaway for us today. And we, we thank God for his faithfulness uh, to the, uh, the Israelites, we thank him for his faithfulness to us believers for the new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ. And I hope that you uh, uh, will be in attendance at your Sunday service uh, this Sunday, the uh, 18th, and that you will be in Sunday school. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of the day and a blessed Lord's Day.